Welcome to the podcast. I am Gene Natali with Troutwood. Today we are going to be discussing what aspiring leaders need to know about personal finance. We're going to be having a conversation with Greg Fuhr. Greg is the CEO of Bear Tongue Advisors, a Pittsburgh-based financial advisory firm. Uh, in terms of a, a short and necessary disclosure, Greg offers securities and investment products and services offered through Waddell and Reed Inc., a member of FINRA, SIPC. Bear Tongue Advisors is a separate entity from Waddell Reed Inc. I have personally gotten to know Greg over the past few months. His uh, passion for helping to educate and prepare our next generation of leaders, our Gen Z audience, is highly contagious. Greg, welcome. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Well, and Greg, normally we prepare a, a you know show notes and, and prepare well in advance, but having gotten to know you, you and I didn't do that. We're going to be shooting from the hip today, and I'm I'm kind of excited about that. It's it's a blessing and a curse, right? So for those of you who are listening to, we might go squirrel down a few holes, but uh, it'll all be good stuff and a lot of great information we have to cover today. Well, and we're going to be kind of bucketing our conversation, but I'm going to hit you right out the gate. Our title topic, what aspiring leaders need to know about personal finance. Let's tell that audience in 30 seconds what they need to know. Absolutely. That's pretty simple to me. What you need to know is you can't lead others well unless you lead yourself well first. If you're on a plane and all of a sudden the plane starts to go down, these oxygen masks pop from the ceiling and they tell you, you better put that oxygen mask on yourself first before you help others that can't put that oxygen mask on themselves. We as a, a leader, we want to help that other person before we help ourselves but you're not good to anyone else if you don't help yourself. And that really starts with personal finances. If your personal finances are not in order as a leader, you are going to have a hard time leading others. Oh, Greg, I love that analogy. I'm thinking servant leadership as you said that, and, and we can fall into that trap of wanting to serve so badly as leaders and forgetting not to, to look out for ourselves first. We're now going to spend the next 30 minutes expanding that conversation. Uh, and kind of three buckets of we've broken this into leadership, entrepreneurship, financial literacy, yeah. and maybe we bucket 10 minutes for each of those. Let's dive right into leadership uh, and, and piggyback off of your comments there. Yeah. So I think that's a, a great way to start out with, uh, with leadership. And, you know, one of the things about leadership is it gets stressful. There are going to be times when any type of leadership, I don't care whether you're in junior or high and you're on student council or you get to run a company. Anytime that you have leadership position, it gets stressful. The number one reason for stress is often cited in America as money issues. So why add more stress to your life if you're a leader? By having a bad financial house. And that's what I'm talking about by putting that oxygen mask on first. If you're a young aspiring leader and you're trying to do put all the tools in your tool shed, that you can have to pull out when you need them when you get to that leadership position. One of the easiest ones to work on and one of the most glaring ones is put yourself in a great financial position. You could do that simply. When you're in high school, start working a second job and start saving money. When you're in college, keep working jobs and saving money. If you don't go to college, you go right into the workforce. Start saving money. Start denying yourself things that you want now to position yourself to be in a leadership position in the future. So often I hear from leaders, they never got the opportunity, right? They, they never had a chance to get in a leadership position. But a lot of times I always say, did you make yourself the obvious choice? Did you position yourself well? Well, one of those things that starts with is personal finances. If you haven't put yourself in a position to make those decisions, you can't be in a leadership position. One of the Greg, I want to. You, you said something that got me thinking here. Um, yeah. You referenced the middle school student council. I'm thinking of how many conversations I've had in the last year with college students who are extremely stressed out. And it's not the COVID stress that we would think about. It's the Gene, I'm the head of my sorority, and this is happening. Or, or Gene, I'm on this sports team, and it's and it's stressful. I know it's not directly applicable to our conversation, but it's stress. And it's stress from a leadership role. Uh, and that stress could be maybe preventing them or even causing mistakes elsewhere in their life. How can we help to navigate that arena? Yeah, so that, that's actually a great question. 
I can empathize there. Uh, I always joke around. So most of my leadership principles I learned were from getting 25 guys in my fraternity to do something. Right. <laughs> so I always say, if you get 25 immature idiots and I say that lovingly and I'm still good friends, with my uh, fraternity brothers, but if you didn't get people that, that don't act right and don't care, if you can lead them and guide them, it's going to help you out the rest of your life. So I'm forever grateful for those opportunities to lead in college. But I think that the reality is a lot of times those stress issues are because you put yourself in a position you can't walk away. Whenever you get to a negotiating table, whatever you're negotiating, and life is all negotiations. Like we think usually the negotiations are very formal. Like it's some head of state versus some other head of state or you're negotiating a salary for your job. Anytime you're trying to convince somebody else to do something you want to do, I negotiate with my wife 15 to 20 times a day. So so life's a bunch of negotiations. Greg, who wins? <laughs> she always wins. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot there. Yeah. <laughs> but but you think about it, that's what life is in negotiations. To win a successful negotiation, you have to have the ability to walk away. If you don't have the ability to walk away, the other person at that table is going to know that. Well, if you don't have good finances, you can't walk away. I've seen more people in jobs they don't like and positions they don't want to be in that are stuck in them because of money issues than any other reason. And so let me kind of rephrase that. People are in positions of stress, whether it's in their fraternity, their soccer team, whatever position is in college. It's exactly the same as when you're out of college. They're usually there because they have no other alternative. By setting yourself up financially, you create those avenues that you can walk away. So you're in a job you don't like. Why don't people quit? Because they need the money coming in. If you had a six months runway that you could literally not work for six months ago and find a different job, you can walk away from the table of that job. Also, I've seen a lot of, and, and, and Gene, you know, I've talked about this. I do a lot of coaching for people that are seniors in college that are looking to get into this field, right? So that's one of my passions in life. I spend a lot of time mentoring the next generation of uh, certified financial planning professionals. A lot of times what ends up happening is they take the first job that's offered to them and they take a job they don't want because they haven't created the runway to have six or 12 months of not working. Or they're not willing to, someone I talk about later when we talk about entrepreneurship, they're not willing to pay the price of maybe going and working a job. At, you know, I actually worked at a beer distributor when I was right out of college, supplementing my income to try to wait for that job. So I think that that's the big thing about a leadership opportunity is by having that money, you can walk away from the table. And that's what reduces that stress. When And when you're a leader... Going back to a comment you just made on negotiating, and part of negotiating is having the confidence to walk away. I think it's important we frame that when you are a leader, you're not just negotiating for yourself. That's so true. As a leader, the majority of your negotiations, especially if you're a servant leader, are for other people. And even when you think it's for yourself, it's really for other people. And, and that's why you have to put that mask on first. Because if you don't have the good finances, let me give you another example. If you end up, and this kind of goes in that entrepreneurship conversation, we can touch on this later. But if you're a leader, you have to be willing to sacrifice for others. So if there's an economic downturn and your company's not doing well, you don't cut the pay of people underneath you. You cut your pay. Yeah. Well, you can only do that if you're in a financial position to do so. And if you haven't put yourself in that financial position to do so, now you're going to have to make business decisions and leadership decisions that are going to have impact for the rest of your life. You might lose great team members all because you didn't put yourself in position. You might emotionally want to do it. You might say, oh, this would be great if I could do it. But if you haven't put yourself in that position, you can't do it. And that's why you can't lead well unless you lead yourself well. And you can't lead yourself well unless your personal finances are in order. Lead by example. That's right. Greg, what if, if I'm an aspiring leader? in high school or college or, you know, curious about that. Is there training courses you recommend? Are there steps I can take at that age to position myself to, to learn? 
to learn about finances or to learn about leadership? No, just throw in the leadership bucket. If I, if I say, boy, I, that's interesting. I want to be a servant leader. I want to lead by example. I recognize there's a lot I need to learn. Well, I'll tell you, the first thing you can do is be teachable. Um, yeah. One of the things I see from, from young expiring leaders, and people want to say it's generational. It's always the same. It's just a... I was the same way, right? We, we just come up and we think we might know more or we think, we think we've learned something. We think we're different. Be teachable, be moldable. And uh, what I would say is find somebody that you admire and reach out to them and formally ask to be mentored. Uh, I think this is an art that people don't understand well. And I've had many people reach out to be mentored and the ask part is easy. And you'd be surprised how many high level leaders, if you just ask them, but that's one thing to get to, the, to open up that opportunity. The second part is to keep that opportunity open. So I can't tell you how many times I've met with a young uh, leader and they have come to me not prepared at all. They don't have any questions written down. They look at it like they're just talking to me. And then after the meeting, they don't write me a handwritten thank you note. They never follow up with me. I always say set the next meeting. They never reach out to set the, set the next meeting. But the biggest thing you can do if you're being mentored is – show the ROI, return on investment. So if a mentor tells you anything, like if you heard something I said in this podcast that literally changed the trajectory of your life, reach out to me and say, hey, Greg, I just want you to know that little nugget of information you told me, it impacted my life. I actually do this once a year. I write down the people that have had a huge impact on my life in my journal. And I actually write them a thank you note about that moment in time that they told me something that impacted my life. So if you're an aspiring leader and you want to grow, the best way to do it is to find a mentor. And if you find a mentor, you've got to let them know return on investment. The second one is just readers are leaders. Excuse me, leaders are readers. Mm. Start reading. And I, can go on, I can go on for hours, but I have yet to be a high-level leader that doesn't read at least 12 books a year. I'm sure they exist, but that would be not the majority. Almost every person I've ever met that is in some type of leadership position reads on average two to three books a month. And, and I would say reading can include audio books and podcasts now too. There's different mediums. Uh, so let's, let's, let's be clear. When I say reading, I, I am an audible learner. Uh, my wife and I, she always says, I, I can't say I read. My wife reads about six to eight books a month, but they're all romance novels and, and fiction. I read nonfiction and she'll sit there and say, I do. Uh, I'm a person of faith. So I have to I read the Bible every day. I go through the Bible in a year. That one I actually read in person. But I actually, the reason why I listen to Audible is not just because I can do it while I'm out running, which is great and other things, but I learned really quickly. I'm an Audible learner. So don't let somebody tell you that you have to read a book because when I was in college, if I would go to a lecture and listen and not read a book, I would get A's on the exam. If I didn't go to the lectures and just read the books, I would get C's. I listen Audible. I, I'm, I, that's the way God gifted me uniquely. And so I actually have done this as a for myself if i read a paper book versus listen to an audible book i retain more information and just a quick nugget i know this isn't what we're talking about here but i created this habit a long time ago if you start reading the best thing you can do is write a book report afterwards i don't write a formal book report where it's line and stuff i just i write down sticky notes as i'm reading i you know find the parts i want a lot of times if it's a really good book I'll listen to it two or three times and then I'll actually buy the paperback just to get some of the notes highlighted. Mm -hmm. But I have a report because now I have an encyclopedic knowledge of all the books I've ever read that I can go back and access. I'm like, Oh, I can't remember that topic. So if you're going to invest four to eight hours of your life in a book, you better get the return on investment, write a book report it takes 15, 20 minutes and you won't ever regret it. Greg, I put my educator hat on as you were talking and I was thinking, boy, what a neat assignment to have students pick a mentor and, and write an email, double check it, you know, that first impressions matter, make sure there's no spelling errors, make sure it's communicating. Uh, so as I was thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this on you for our audience. Greg, let's, let's put you back in that 18 year old high school, that 22 year old college student mm -hmm. and pretend I'm a mentor you wanna reach out to. Could you, could you give a mock for what that might look like for that high school or college student? Absolutely, and I'm gonna tell you a trick of mine. Always started out with, I would love to take you out for coffee because I admire what you've done and I would like to learn how to do what you did 
to position myself to have as much success as you have. Would it be, would you be available at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. over the next two weeks? A couple subtle things I did in there. One, I let the leader know how much I respected them and that I want to learn from them so that I could be like them. I also asked them out for coffee, but I said, I would like to buy you a cup of coffee. No leader's going to make a college kid pay for a cup of coffee if you go out, but it's that title of respect that you're showing them. And a third subtle thing I did in there that I always recommend is I almost every leader I've met ends up being an early bird. They end up being an early bird, not because, and by the way, I, I'm a night owl, but I've programmed myself to get up early because once 8.30 a.m. hits, other people's priorities invade your priorities. So the only way to get stuff done without somebody calling you is to do it in the morning. That's why leaders become morning people. It's not something special that you get up in the morning. It's simply just because nobody else bothers you during that time period. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying to them is I'm a young person that is, I think this meeting is so important. I'm willing to push this above all my other priorities. Not many young people are willing to get up that early. They'll get up that early. You know, when I grew up, a lot of my friends were hunters. So they get up early, go hunting or football practice had to be early, but on average, and there are some out there, right? I'm not saying I'm painting with a broad brush here, but what you're saying to that person is this meeting is so important. I want to get it done early, but you're also saying subliminal to that leader. Your time during the day is so important. I want to hit you before your important time. The last thing I will tell you is don't ever try to meet with a leader in the evenings because most leaders are in a position in their life where they have a family and you're taking away family time. When you do the mornings, you're taken away from their time. When you do the day, you're taken away from work time. When you do the evenings and weekends, you're taken away from that leader's family time if they have a family. I paint the broad brush you're going to find and, and know that. But I, I have found that subtle thing not only works for me, but it's worked for a lot of people. So that email would have that type of context to it. And, and the knowledge is priceless. I like that you said, be prepared, Go, come in and, and know what you're going to be doing. Uh, you have to. I mean, if you are getting somebody that is a high level leader, that is responsible for a, leading a lot of people, their time is valuable. There's one commodity that you cannot replicate. doesn't matter how powerful you are. You cannot buy time. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a finite thing. It's a resource. It's not renewable. It's finite. It's the, the when somebody that's a high level leader gives you your time, you should act like they gave you a million dollars, and you need to treat it that way. And so I always use this example: What if you got to meet with the president of the United States, right? And I just use that because that's usually the highest level leader in the entire world at a given time is whoever's the president, right? If you met with the president of the United States, would you be prepared for that meeting, <laughs> or how would you prepare? However, you prepare for that. Every time you reach out to a mentor, you should treat that way. I love it. Greg, I'm going to bridge us to the second silo we introduced with leadership, entrepreneurship, financial literacy were the three. We're going to bridge to entrepreneurship now. Uh, and I know your, your passion for this topic. I'm going to bridge it with a book. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Lean Startup. I am familiar with that. And the, the, the premise for anyone not familiar is that all of us are entrepreneurs. You don't have to start a business and take that chance to be an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur every day in your job if you adopt that mentality. And I'm going to bridge to leadership by saying it's the same with leadership. You don't have to hold the top seat to be a leader. It's a triangle that that, that comes down. So is that a fair bridge as we push to entrepreneurship? That's a fair bridge. And that's a great bridge, honestly. Uh, by the way, I, I subscribe to the upside down triangle if you've read the book, The Servant. Um, but it's the same concept, but it's, I, but I totally agree. We say this all the time on our team. We want the entrepreneurial mentality, not employee mentality. Uh, we do believe that every single person is an entrepreneur. Every single person's a leader. Uh, there's a term out there that's really popular called intrapreneurship instead of entrepreneurship, being entrepreneur inside your company. When you bring new ideas to the table and you make the company more successful, yeah, I think that there's this common outage, especially in my industry, but any professional services, doctors and lawyers, just because you're an excellent doctor doesn't make you an excellent entrepreneur. Uh, just because you're an excellent lawyer doesn't make you an excellent entrepreneur. We see this in sales all the time. Somebody's really successful in sales and they try to make them a leader. 
sometimes they should not be a leader, right? So I think it's so important to understand what do we mean by entrepreneurship? I think entrepreneurship is the ability to innovate ideas and solve problems in the marketplace is how I would define entrepreneurship. There's all these other definitions. You might say I'm incorrect in that, but that's the context of our conversation. I think that's what it is. And I think there's just so many times I've seen people go out and start their own company for no reason other than they just wanted to start their own company. You know, I always heard, used to hear this commercial on the radio and maybe that dates myself that I still listen to the radio sometimes, but there was always this commercial out there. It was like, are you tired of the rat race? You're going to the office nine to five. You're doing all this stuff. Start a successful business. And it would always be some pitch for some type of franchise, right? And it was the same pitch. And they would literally plug in a new franchise every couple months, whatever the hot thing was. And I've just seen it so often that people go out and uh, there's a term, uh, Matt Keller, who's a, a leadership guru that I have a lot of respect for. He used to have the Matt Keller Leadership Podcast. He used to always call it accidental business owners. And I was always like, I, I want you to write a book about that. I, maybe somebody else coined that term somewhere along the way, but that's who I always heard it from. But I know that so often in life. And he gave the example, he's from Florida, and concrete is really big in the area he's from. And so he said, I would know all these guys that are these concrete companies. And you ask him why I started a concrete company. Well, they just started because they just started pouring concrete on their own. And next thing you know, they got more jobs. They hire, And before you do it, they had 100 people, and they didn't know what to do. They didn't want to be a business owner. They knew nothing about accounting. They knew nothing about business strategy, but they knew how to make concrete really well. And they served their clients really well and they were solving people's problems. And what they actually want is they don't want to be an entrepreneur. And I think that that's where it gets misread. Like, so you can be an entrepreneur without starting your own company. So I think when we talk about being an entrepreneur, I think people automatically think starting your own company. Um, but I don't think you need to start your own company to do it. That's a great perspective. In, in terms of how we're talking, Greg, it's a circle. We're not pulling like little tangents off of here where you go on an island. If it works, you retreat mm -hmm. back. It's kind of this circle of life where you're, you're growing individually, you're growing professionally, you're building your trade and your skill set. I'll share a story real quick. I think we'll, we'll spark you. So much good happens in the classroom on this concept of aspiring leaders, personal finance. I received an email from a high school educator who had a student who because this student took a personal finance class, um, was not going to go to college, but started a dog grooming business. That high school student is now three years out of high school and has three locations for their dog grooming business because they blended kind of what we're talking about, Greg, took a high school personal finance class, or was had a passion for dogs and, and dog grooming and built a successful business. You know, quick story about that. I, and I love those stories, by the way. I love, I have a, I love college, by the way. Um, I, I'm a, my, my company's core values, education's number two. Um, we're really big in a formal education and I love formal education, but I think sometimes. I have to ask what's number one. Oh, teamwork. So teamwork. <laughs> and teamwork to us is a mental state. It's not like we, we work together as a team. It's about all of us rowing together in the same direction and, and having a shared common vision and stuff. So, but education, we have them ordered in, in the, the order of importance, by the way. It's huge importance. So I love education and I will never take away from formal education. But I think sometimes what gets in the way of formal education is it's a means to an end, right? So you, you get that education so that you can go and apply it. To, to your life. What's the point? I mean, and don't get wrong. I, I actually am working on a master's that I won't apply to my life because I just love theology and working on a master's. So there are time and place for that. But when we're talking to young, inspiring leaders, you're going to get that formal education to implement it. And how many people do you know go get that formal education and it has nothing to do with what they do? So there's a, there's a gentleman actually in Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania, who is uh, in high school at Mount Lebanon. And our good friends that live there are actually looking to get some landscaping done. And they got referred to this person and he said, well, I can only come in the evenings or weekends. I'm in school. So they thought he was in college, right? Kid shows up, goes and gets a formal quote. He does measurements. They said of the four people they got to give the best quotes. He had a system. He literally was able to plug it into his phone, push out a formal quote on paper, give it to them. It sent them an automatic email to their email. And then a fine night goes, well, my cruise will be here during the week. They said, well, I thought you only do evenings and weekends. He goes, oh no, I'm a high school student. That's my team. He has a team of 15 adults. And I say adults because this kid's under 18 that are working for him. And his business has grown 200% <laughs> while he's in high school. 
It, it's fantastic. I mean, the, he understands how the business, but more importantly, the consumer, my friends that were telling me the story, they love the great story that he was a, a, as a young, he just gave the best service. He literally gave the best quote system. He utilized technology. He solved their problem. And he didn't have that formal education. He didn't have anything else other than he positioned himself. Well, how was he able to do that? Because they started asking him a story. It came down to the personal finance game. It wasn't because he was from a wealthy family. It was because he simply started doing lawn work on the side. He started making money. He saved that money. He didn't spend it. Granted, he was in a family that was well off enough that he could save 100% of that. Like he didn't have to use that money to help the family out. Um, so that's a huge advantage. He obviously lived in a wealthier neighborhood. Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania is a wealthier neighborhood. But he could have lived in another neighborhood and done the same type of thing. He could have gone to a wealthier neighborhood. And every successful leader I have ever met, and I'm not saying there's not, but everyone I've ever met has some type of story like that, that they start it without anyone telling them to do that, and they start at a young age. You've got to position yourself because I'm a marathon runner. And if you want to run a marathon, you can't just go out and start running a marathon. you got to start running a 5K. you got to run a 10K. You have to compound over time. You have you can't just say, oh, I have a, a nobody hits the lottery. And I say nobody, people hit it, obviously. Not nobody comes from these wealthy families. These are such small percentages of people that come from that. Most of us have to work for everything we get. That's the American dream. But it doesn't come out over time. You got to start when you're 16 saving and compound and compound and compound. And if you haven't done that and you're 30 years old, don't worry. Start where you're at. Yeah, you're gonna start behind people. But just start. There's never a wrong time to start. I can tell you stories. People start when they're 60. But that's the problem. People don't realize. And one of the things I want to really hit the point on entrepreneurship that's really important to me is you have to pay the price. Everyone talks about, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do this. At the beginning of the year, people talk about losing weight. The gyms fill up. But how many people lose weight? Everyone wants to talk a game about, I want to go and start my own business. You have to position yourself. So I started my own business. People are like, Greg, how did you do that? I saved money. I put in a sizable chunk of change. I didn't get that given to me by my parents. I didn't get that and go out and borrow it from a bank. I worked my butt off for years. My first year I was in the industry, I made $6,000, but it cost me $35,000 to have that job. How did I do that? I worked two jobs in the evenings. I worked my way through college. I worked three jobs working my way through college. I compounded that and saved that money. I lived a good life. It's not like I didn't do the things I wanted to do, but I was able to do delayed gratification, push things off and not do things so that I could position myself when I wanted to start my own company. I worked for a great Fortune 500 company. I had a great position. I had great leaders around me, but I wanted to do stuff uniquely different. I was a per person of faith. I wanted to wind my faith into my business. You can't do that in a Fortune 500 company. So I want to do these things, but I position myself because of personal finances to be able to do that. I was able to take a risk that others can't do. I can make that leap of faith. So in my industry, I'm recruiting advisors all the time. It's hard to get advisors to come over because they don't want to make that leap of faith. If their clients will go with them, some people can't take their clients with them. You know, I was in a position where I couldn't solicit my clients. I, I had a contract, so I couldn't solicit them legally. So I had to start over again. How was I able to do that? Why well, I had money to get me through those times. And that's really what it is about paying the price. Everyone talks about paying a price, but are you actually willing to pay it? And when you say paying a price for entrepreneurship, it's one, pulling money out of your pocket. Two, it's working hard. And three, it's willing to push through when others aren't. But if you don't have that money piece, you have to get it. And if you don't have it saved up your own, you have to do what unfortunately a lot of entrepreneurs do. And they have to use what I like to call OPM, other people's money. They go out and they borrow, whether it's venture capitalist money, money from the bank, wherever it might be. That's how a lot of people start their business. And then what ends up happening is they become a slave to that interest and that loan. And they can't. And why I use the term slave is because they have no choice. Greg, what's so interesting with what you're saying in the startup world, VC is viewed as uh, an accomplishment or an opportunity. And I'm hearing you, it's an obligation. 
it's but it's an obligation you're in control of, right? If I like get back into this correctly, if I am adopting this entrepreneurship mindset and I, I'm going to add a number four to your, your three and that's betting on yourself. Yep. I Start betting on yourself early. Put put that little bit away so that with this big bet you're making on yourself, you can have a fighting chance at not needing uh, OPM, other people's money. That's right. Hey, if you're going to save 10% into an investment account, why not put 10% into your account? Put cash away if you want to yes. launch a business. I love it. Yes. Like ding, 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 ding in the classroom right now. What a That's great it. assignment. And, and, and it's so... Because people, they, they we, it's kind of like the formal education. I love formal education, but not everyone should have a formal education. It does, it doesn't provide for everyone. Not everyone should be an entrepreneur, but the ones that really want to, start preparing for that. Start putting yourself, make yourself in a position that you can write your own ticket. You know, the other thing about VC that happens so often is one of the problems that destroy a lot of businesses is easy cash. Why capitalism works so well is resources are limited. So I only have 168 hours in a week as every other person does. So I can only work so hard. That requires me to think about where I work. Same thing with money. If I only have $100,000 to put into a business, that's going to make the decision how much I spend on marketing, how much I spend on this is why you have a business plan. But if you give me a million dollars opposed to $100,000, you make decisions that aren't as good as if you were limited to resources. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that ends up happening to other thing with other people's money is it helps you to make worse decisions because people always act differently with their money than other people's money. If it's money you had to save and you feel that pain for, you're going to spend it differently than somebody that gives you a fat check that all you had to do was a fancy presentation for. And let me take that a step further. When people get into debt, one of the things they want to do is they want to refinance their way out of debt. They want to find an easy way, just like somebody that maybe wants to lose weight through liposuction as opposed to working out. Multiple studies have shown this, and you can go and Google this and find different studies, but it's usually 70% is about the number I see for most studies of somebody that gets a windfall to pay off debt ends up back in the same amount of debt within three to four years. So let me put that in other words. If you had accumulated debt as a business, and somebody came in and gave you money to grow because you couldn't grow, you had a great idea, you're probably going to go back to that debt. On the personal finance side, if you ran up credit card debt to say $30,000, and then you go and get a bank to refinance that $30,000 in a fixed loan, you're probably going to run that other $30,000 back up before paying that $30,000 down. You never felt the pain mm -hmm. of what that debt caused to you so that's why I like a lot of times when I'm talking to clients, they're maybe helping, they think they're helping their children by paying off their debt and then restructuring a loan with the parents. You're not because that, that, that person needs to feel that pain of that debt. Cause when you feel that pain, you're most likely never going to go back into that debt. And, and debt just becomes this point where it stops you from making decisions. You want to open up that business, but you don't have access to capital. Here's all the time. You have access to capital. It's called your income save or people that want to go and launch a business and just stop working. Well, go and launch your business in the evenings, work all the evenings, work all the Saturdays. You know, I, I personally, a person of faith, so I don't work Sundays, but Hey, if you want to work Sundays, work Sundays, work seven days a week, do what you need to do. Make this sacrifice. That's what paying the price means. It's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Mm -hmm. Greg, for students that are thinking, boy, where could I do it? Uh, Carnegie Mellon's Entrepreneurship Center, they call the offices garages for the obvious analogy. Carve out a corner of your garage, get a notepad, and start writing ideas down. Uh, I, I'm going to bridge to our, our third bucket because great leaders, great entrepreneurs, we got to understand money. If we don't understand right. money, we can make mistakes. And I'm going to, the, the comment of yours, I'm going to bridge with. I think this is a really important candid comment. You said I worked my butt off. Uh, Greg, I can relate. Similarly, I worked three jobs out of college up until grad school. Work your butt off. It's the best time of your life to do so. Um, <laughs> but what if we work hard and don't understand money, what can happen? You know, well, the, the, take it away. <laughs> I think there's something that needs to be said about this. So a lot of people understand working hard. But what they don't understand is working hard doesn't get you anywhere. 
If I gave you a shovel and said work really hard and you just started digging without any direction, all we ended up was a giant hole. <laughs> but if I gave you direction, we could have a tunnel to get where we want to get. So I see this so often that, that you know it's, we glorify being busy in our society. Busy, busy, busy. Everyone's busy. I, you know, I, I used to be in a, a, this, what's called a youth group advisor at my church, and it's a, it's a group for youth to come together. And I remember sitting down, and we were all excited. We we're going to take them all to this water park that's in Erie, PA. It's called uh, Splash Lagoon. And I'm thinking, like, this is a really cool thing we're doing. We got one of the members of the church to pay for it. And all the kids, and this is a good day myself, they all bought up their Blackberries, and they started typing their Blackberries, pulled their calendar. I'm like, you're in ninth grade. And you're worried about your calendar? Like when I was in eighth grade, like, so we glorify being busy. Hard work alone won't get you anywhere. You have to have hard work with a purpose. Just saving money willy nilly ain't going to get you to start your business. You have to have a business plan. So just because you worked hard doesn't mean your business is successful. I can tell you story after story of people that launched a business with a great idea that worked hard. But because they had no strategy, they weren't able to do it. So I think when it comes to financial literacy, which is really what we're talking about here, this hard work thing, you have to put the two and two together. So if you're going to work hard, what you have to do is reserve that hard work. Really what currency is when you think about it, and we could talk about like monetary policy and currency to we're blue in the face, but the easiest way to think about it is you are taking your energy, your work, and put it into another format. So, so let me think about this. If I build a widget, it took me two hours to build a widget, and somebody paid me twenty dollars for that widget. They're essentially taking my hard work, and I'm taking an IOU for my hard work. So you're storing up your hard work. So if you have 168 hours in a week, when you get paid for that, anything you keep is bottling your time and hard work. So when you only have 168 hours in the future, you could pay somebody that extends your 168 hours with those dollars. So that's kind of a, a really high level concept. And let me just cover that again, if because I know sometimes it gets lost. One way to look at currency as, as accumulating currency is the reserves of your personal hard work. Mm -hmm. When you think about it that way, that helps you to start accumulating a lot more because then you start to say, all right. That puts me in a position to take what I've done and compound on the years of my hard work and have something for it. But if you don't have a strategy behind your hard work, all that money goes away. So you've, you've worked hard, but you have nothing to show for it if you haven't accumulated the dollars behind it. Great. What's the biggest money mistake you see young leaders make? You know, I often hear this all the time is it's debt. I don't think it is. I actually, honestly, I think going in a little bit of debt when you're younger teaches you great lessons. You know, one of the arguments my wife and I have all the time, I do not want to pay for my daughter's college education. Uh, first off, I think the math behind it is different. You know, 1970, my dad worked a part-time job and was able to pay for optometry school. He can't do that. I mean, it's just a, it's been, mm -hmm. the inflation's out of control. And we could talk about that all, all day long, how out of control our inflation is for education. But there's a reason for that is I want her to feel the pain. I want her to understand what it's like. So coming out of school with a little bit of student loan debt is actually, I think, a good thing because learning how to pay it down teaches you life lessons. I would say the number one problem that I see is no forward-looking plan. I'm not saying you have to have a retirement plan when you're 16, but a plan for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's not hard work. It goes back to what we're saying. It's what's the point of working hard if you just dig and you don't have a hole you're digging for, what's the point? Have some type of goal to work towards because if you don't have that, you're never going to pay down that debt, or that student loan debt. You know, and I just like, again, I, I hear all the stuff about student loan debt. I had student loan debt. I paid it off. I, I, I think the student loan debt is an excuse for people that didn't save money, didn't have a plan. So I don't think it's debt. And I think that's not, not telling you to go and get debt. And I'm not saying that debt. I just think that that's the number one thing that young people are hearing. And I think that that is a symptom, not the problem. The problem is a plan. Everything in life, you need to have a plan for. You need to live life intentionally. If you're drifting through life. You're never going to get there. I always like to use the analogy, you're a ship crossing the Atlantic. So you're coming from Ireland to New York. If you don't course correct every hour, 
You're not going to end up in New York. You're going to end up in Newfoundland. You're going to end up in North Carolina, right? So you have to constantly course correct. Most people that are unhappy to where they're at in life is because they made decisions that they had no idea what they were making. So our company's mission statement is we empower clients to make informed financial decisions. The thing I always say is every day you make a financial decision, whether it's buying a latte at Starbucks, whether it's paying your cable bill, every single day of your life, you're making financial decisions. The question is, are you making informed financial decisions? So Mm -hmm. financial literacy is important. But before financial literacy, just thinking it out. Okay, I paid that $5 for that Starbucks now. Is that $5 I could use later and compound with other ones to start my own company? And and again, not just start your own company because entrepreneurship. It could be changing jobs. You put yourself in the driver's seat when you've built wealth. And I think the other thing I would say that the biggest advice for financial literacy is my wealthiest clients did not inherit wealth. My wealthiest clients did not come from wealthy families. And that's a common thing that I think that financial literacy that you you hear about this is all the time that I think people look at others and they think, well, they had it easy. They didn't have, everyone has a story. Everyone has a hard time. There are, there's a lot of privilege out there. There's a lot of people that come from families of wealth. There's a lot of people that have privilege due to their status in society. I'm not saying that but we all have a hard time. And the the thing is control what you can control and don't worry about the things you can't control. And one of the things is the easiest thing to control. We all control our own money decisions. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's very well said, Greg. I I work with a lot of college students. I teach locally at the university of Pittsburgh. My students come in with tears because of their student debt. When we build a plan, they walk out standing a little taller and a lot more confident. We put a plan around it. We remove the fear. By the way, you made a choice to take on that student loan debt. Nobody forced that down your throat and you got an ROI. You got a great education from a, a great university, especially if you have student loan debt from Pitt, you know, the world's your oyster because it's the greatest university in the land. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, seriously, like, I mean, you, 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 you was an exchange. I don't understand why anyone wants their student loan debt paid back because they're the ones that took it. If you mm-hmm. thought it was a bad deal, why did you take it? Well, I like how I like what you said. Control what you can control. And, and I've heard the analogy. If we stood in a large room and threw our problem into the, the middle of the room, and we saw everyone else's problems, we'd grab ours right back. Control right. what you can control. <laughs> Greg, I'm going to throw, we always, uh, as we bump up against our time here, we always end with the same question. And you and I started with uh, a 30 seconds I gave you to, to address the this big topic of what aspiring leaders need to know about personal finance. I'm going to ask you to wrap up with a similar elevator pitch, but what advice would you give your younger self with what you know now? You know, I think that a lot of people go back when they hear this question and they want to change things. There's things in my life that stunk that I I didn't really care. You know I mean? I, I wouldn't go back and change much. I would just tell myself this advice of confidence and I hear this a lot when I hear this question from other leaders, but it's really the truth that you have a lot more time than you think. Just slow down and be patient. Uh, I was one of these people that just, I wanted to go certain places and I had, I had always had a plan. I always, I, I've always been told you're a very intentional person, but sometimes I would get frustrated because I had, you know, I'm going to use an analogy. If I was driving from Pittsburgh to Orlando, right? So going to Disney world, it's like a 24 hour drive. I'm the type of person who would want to get in a car and try to complete it in 18 hours, right? And say that there's got to be a better way to do this. And if I didn't get there in 18 hours, I'd be frustrated. I think that that's the thing I would go back and tell myself is be patient. It takes time to accumulate wealth. It takes time to make good financial decisions. You know, hard work doesn't pay off immediately. You just have to be patient. It's just like, again, I'm a runner. I like to use marathon analogy. You know, it takes a long time to train for a marathon. And it's really, really, really simple to do. It's just not easy to do, mm. right? So it's simple. It's simplistic. You just follow the plan. Any person, any person can run a marathon. I have seen people that have unbelievable challenges that you would say can never run a marathon, but they do it. And they do it by following a plan and they're patient about it. That patience is what I wish I had and what I mentor every person to have. 
just because you're in a place you don't like in life doesn't mean you make a brash decision and leave it. Mm. Just keep doing those things. And that's what personal finance is. Personal finance is all about patience. Uh, Greg, that was excellent. Uh, Greg, on behalf of the Trowwood community, thank you. This was a lot of fun today. It's, it was my absolute honor and a pleasure. If you if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm a very active person on LinkedIn. Uh, I would love to hear from you. If this had an impact, I would love to hear as well. We appreciate that. Thank you. To everyone tuning in, thank you.